Hello and welcome to Africa This Week with me, Ayo Johnson. This show looks at the affairs of sub-Saharan Africa and the African diaspora. Today, we'll be looking at ethical fashion and asking if it's simply a fad or is it something here to stay with us. We'll also be having a report on Ethiopia, which has sub-Saharan Africa's only modern tramrail. But first, on Sunday, Ivorian President Latin Watara issued what he called a message of national reconciliation during what a visit to the stronghold of his predecessor, Laurent Gbagbo, less than a month before the country's presidential elections. Admiral Munu has the latest headlines. Watara is the favourite to win the October 25th vote, seen as crucial to restoring stability in the country after post-poll violence in 2010 and 11, which left more than 3,000 people dead. The unrest was triggered by Gabo's refusal to step down and acknowledge Ouattara's victory at the ballot box. In 2012, the International Criminal Court gave its prosecutor the green light to extend a war crimes probe back to 2002, noting that government forces attacked the village of Monokozohi near Doloa in that year, which left 120 civilians dead. On Tuesday, the International Organization for Migration appealed for funds to fly home 387 Ethiopians who have been held in a Malawi prison, even after serving their sentences for illegal entry. Malawi, which is a transit route for many Ethiopians, Somalis and other Africans seeking work in South Africa, says it has seen a sharp rise in migrants in recent months. Many have served a six-month sentence, but have been held for a further nine months or more at the overcrowded Maula prison in the administrative capital, Lilongwe, waiting repatriation. The Malawian government reportedly accused the migrants of posing a security threat, but High Court Judge Kemanda recently proposed that migrants should be issued with deportation orders rather than put on trial and jailed. A leader of the Al-Qaeda-linked Tuareg group accused of ordering the destruction of treasured monuments in Mali's Timbuktu face international criminal court judges for the first time on Wednesday. The case is the first to be brought over violence that rocked Mali in 2012 and 2013. Faqi, a Tuareg leader also known as Abu Turab, is accused of war crimes over the deliberate destruction of buildings at a UNESCO-listed desert heritage site in 2012. Nicknamed the city of 333 saints, Timbuktu was overrun by the Tuareg group in the spring of 2012. The group destroyed more than a dozen of the city's mausoleums, dating back to its golden age as an economic, intellectual and spiritual centre in the 15th and 16th centuries. One week after the deadly stampede during the annual Muslim pilgrimage, in which 60 Malians perished according to a latest death toll, several families still have no news from their relatives. Salamata Anna Baby is trying all means to get hold of her mother, who was on the pilgrimage alone. Several African and North African countries confirmed deaths, as did India, Indonesia, Pakistan and the Netherlands. Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari on Thursday called for what he said was unruly behaviour in the country, saying progress could not happen without a change in citizens' attitudes. The call, made in his first Independence Day address as civilian president, will likely remind some of his time as a military ruler in the 80s, when he cracked down on so-called indiscipline. Buhari, elected in March on an agenda for change, has been at pains to stress there will be no return to the past, despite claims to the contrary by his political opponents that old habits die hard. On Friday, at least 10 people died and 39 others were injured after four suicide bombers blew themselves up in the city of Maiduguri in northeast Nigeria. Burkina troops were on Wednesday hunting the remaining guards behind a coup a day after storming their barracks as the EU hailed the end of the unrest and urged speedy elections. Tuesday night's raid saw troops in the capital Ugadugu firing heavy weaponry at the barracks of the elite presidential guard who staged an abortive coup on September 17th. Although the unit formally abandoned their coup efforts last week, allowing the interim leadership to resume office, they refused to disarm under the terms of a peace deal, creating fresh tension with the military, which came to a head late on Tuesday. 
Amnesty International Wednesday called on the Central African Republic to confiscate and sell diamonds amassed by traders worth millions that could be fueling militia violence and child labour. Huge stockpiles of possible conflict diamonds could end up on the global market when a ban on exports from the country is lifted, the rights group said in a report. Researchers also documented a string of human rights abuses in the country's diamond mines, with children as young as 11 working in hazardous conditions. The export of diamonds from the Central African Republic was banned in 2013 under the Kimberley process, which aims to stem the flow of so-called conflict diamonds. The ban will be partially lifted once the government meets conditions set in July 2015. Violence fled again in the Central African Republic last weekend when deadly clashes broke out following the murder of a Muslim motorcycle taxi driver in Bangui. The streets of the capital were deserted on Tuesday with terrified residents sheltering indoors and tens of thousands fleeing their homes after three days of shooting and bloodshed that have left at least 36 dead, according to the UN. Adma Munu, Africa This Week. To discuss the latest story, we have Lucy Graham from Amnesty International, who wrote the report entitled Chains of Abuse, a case for diamonds from Central African Republic and the global diamond supply chain. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, diamonds, the Kimberley process uh, applied to Central African Republic in 2013. Um, however, it was meant to stop the trade of diamonds. As we've seen, it hasn't happened. Um, diamond smuggling has continued. Uh, what do you think has gone wrong? I think one of the key issues with the Kimberley process is it addresses the external trade of diamonds, so trying to stop conflict diamonds getting to you and me as consumers. What it doesn't do is address the internal trade within the Central African Republic, and that's inevitably continued because there's a lot of small-scale miners who depend on diamonds for their livelihood, but at the same time there are armed groups within the Central African Republic who are demanding protection payments of traders or taxing traders, and therefore they're also making a profit off the diamond trade. And, and that's why we're calling on um, governments and companies to really do more to look at the issues within the Kimberley process and to also try and address some of the wider issues in the diamond supply chain. Yes, the wider issues. I mean, the ban um, partially lifted by the government uh, meant that the uh, conditions set by the Kimberley process could go through. Uh, what do you think are the conditions that have uh, sort of surrounded the Kimberley process itself? So the ban actually remains in place because the conditions that were set were looking at things like making sure that the government has adequate control over these areas, making sure armed groups aren't systematically extracting money from the diamond trade in those areas. And so we haven't actually reached the stage yet where the government has been able to do that. So the ban remains in place. What it means is that you have all these diamonds that are currently in stockpile in Bongi. We're saying that the companies that have bought those diamonds haven't checked the story behind them, haven't checked to make sure that they haven't funded armed groups. And we're concerned that actually those companies are going to be able to profit if they sell those diamonds without having really checked the story behind them. Well, the story behind them and profit levels always escalating, which is what keeps these um, issues going. Um, conflict diamonds, as they're otherwise known, we've seen that in Central African Republic. We've also seen that in places like Sierra Leone mm. um, with conflict diamonds. How does that compare with the conflict in Sierra Leone and Central African Republic? And, to, to what extent do these diamonds continue to become a problem? I think what was interesting about Sierra Leone and Angola, for example, is the level of control that the armed groups had over the diamond mines and the trade. So, you know, they had systematic control of an area. They were exporting diamonds and making a significant amount of profit. What you see in the Central African Republic is that the armed groups, rather than mining and selling the diamonds on the whole, they're actually just at a level above taxing the traders, demanding protection payments. So it's a slightly different situation, but of course not any less serious because, the, as we can see, those armed groups take funding from doing that, and that's one of the things that fuels the conflict. Uh, the, the conflict, again, has horroring tales um, across the world, which we've heard and many have seen. Um, in the report specifically, um, Salaka Republic and Anti-Balaka groups mm. in Central African Republic have both benefited from the diamond trade. Uh, and in, to what extent would the miners themselves have a degree of protection? How concerned are you? We are concerned. I mean, 
In the Central African Republic, the miners have always had quite a precarious existence. The report was trying to point out the historical human rights abuses around the trade. So, for example, we found a child miner who was 11 years old mining there. There have been historical problems with human rights abuses, but the conflict has obviously made their lives more precarious. I mean, you're talking about people who are mining in the middle of the countryside, armed groups involved in that as well. And so the report is highlighting the more precarious nature of their existence, but also calling more fundamentally on the government to do something to address the livelihoods issue. The fact that these miners slave away in these mines and they're not being paid um, adequate money for the diamonds, and that leads to, you know, entrenched poverty in these areas as well. Well, the, the governments always have a role to play, but what about Antwerp? the Diamonds Trading Centre, they, they've implemented 100% strict controls of diamonds coming in and going out. Um, we know that exactly that most recently um, a ship was intercepted with diamonds and if it hadn't been for that process, uh, that ship name may never have been found. Mm. Um, how concerned are you? What, what's, what's, the, what's the response from Amnesty International on this? I think it's really important that Antwerp intercepted those shipments because it shows what controls they have in place, but it also highlights the issue that diamonds from car are entering international supply chains. It's important to point out those diamonds had come from the DRC and gone through Dubai before they were intercepted in Antwerp. So, for example, we know that there are 140,000 carats more diamonds being smuggled out since the conflict began. That's a UN estimate. And that means when you look at how many diamonds have been intercepted and the amount they think have made international markets, that's one concern is that actually consumers are ending up with car diamonds that are linked to conflict and that have financed armed groups. Yes. Terrible financing of armed groups, which keeps the, the fighting going for years on end. Um, the, the country, Central African Republic, is uh, preparing for parliamentary and, uh, of course, presidential elections mm. in October. Um, how confident are you of how much diamonds will play a part uh, and how much is the, the government taking that seriously? I think the government sees diamonds as an important element of their revenue. So it accounted for 50% of exports before the conflict. And the government has lobbied for this lifting of the, or the partial lifting of the Kimberley process ban. And in terms of the elections themselves, my understanding is that they have now been delayed until later this year, potentially. But I think it just shows, you know, the escalating violence in Bongi over the last few days really shows that there's a problem with the international community's response to this crisis, that more funding is required, that MINUSCA, the peacekeeping force there, needs to be properly sourced and needs to be properly peopled as well. And, and the escalating violence shows that. And, you know, there is a concern that elections may come too soon. Thanks for your comments, Lucy Graham from Amnesty International. We now be moving on to discuss articles that have made this week's headlines. Joining me, we have our reporter, Anissa Omar. Anissa. It's been a long week, a lot of stories for you to sort of power through. Uh, which ones have caught your eye? So the first story is from GambiaAffairs.com, uh -huh. and it's called President Jame Honoured in US for Extraordinary Leadership. So it's the President of Gambia, and he's been honoured with an award from the African Leadership Magazine from the US. Well, hang on a second. This is the same leader who has already had a very controversial he is. Um, yeah. uh, he's been criticised by Human Rights Watch. A lot of journalists don't necessarily see him as a fair man. Amnesty, don't you? Yeah. Um, um, uh, why, why give him this award? Well, it's different. It's uh, highlighting his economic policies and health and education and the fact that he's revitalised the economy. So it's not, less, it's not looking at the human rights aspects or, you know, he's very hard on journalists. I mean, there's a quote, he's quoted as saying, journalists are less than 1% of the population. If anyone expects me to listen to 1% of the population to destroy 99% of the population, effectively, you've got to be kidding. So he's not someone that likes, particularly likes, you know, journalism or um, is, you know, creating this sort of climate of fear, as it were, that Amnesty is saying. But this is looking at a different but, issue. But even looking at the 99% that he refers to, ECOWAS uh, refused to endorse his last election win in 2011, citing that uh, opposition uh, uh, were, were intimidated and, and so were the voters as well. This is, this is true, but looking, at, obviously, at the African story, we've got to take the positives sometimes where we, where we can and not necessarily always compare ourselves to the West. In effect, he's doing extremely well, given the, the, given the circumstances. I'm not saying that I'm a complete advocate for his... As a journalist, obviously, I want to say what I want, but looking at it from the economic standpoint and also the fact that economic growth in Gambia has declined due to the fact that the effects of Ebola and tourism 
has have, been, have affected, uh, there's been a, a significant decline in economic growth in that area. So he's really had to be innovative in the way that he works with agriculture and builds these different uh, different infrastructures and systems to necessarily, you know, get the get the economy going. Well, let's keep an eye on him. What's your next story? My next story is um, by Chatham House, and it's Africa Challenge Ambitions: Turkey's Africa uh, Turkey's Africa Policy at the G20 Summit. So we're looking at Turkey's policy in Africa. So this is a new. We've always had the, the Chinese angle. Uh, that's so, been so what, well, then, 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 then now I'm going to be very cautious here. Yes. Why, why is Turkey so interested in Africa? I think everyone's interested in Africa at the moment. It seems to be a whole new sort of Cold War uh, cl climate going on. I would say, really, at the bottom line, it's all about energy. Energy being that Africa is a source of a lot of not only oil, but minerals. And Turkey is really kind of creating that political influence, as it were, via the G20 summit. I would say to clear the ground for economic, uh, economic ties, which it did at the summit. It had a new uh, agreement with Guinea, the bilateral cooperation agreement, which was one of the main outcomes of the summit. We're talking about the summit and its outcomes. I mean, the African Union's head, Zuma, um, referentially said that the last Turkey-Africa summit in 2014 had many action points, but very little substance came out of them. A lot of talk and no action. I would have to agree. But beginning to talk is something. And as I said, there was that agreement that came out of it. And creating that discussion would only, next meeting, hopefully there'll be some action. So African leaders have to work slightly harder and demand more. Effectively. OK. And what's your next story? Our next story is from the Sudan Tribune. And it's looking at Ethiopia and Djibouti building a 1.5 billion fuel pipeline venture. So this is really looking, kind of harking back to the story that we just did, that there is this new climate of economic growth, in this case in East Africa, and African countries working together to build that. Well, I always get excited when I hear about building things. But yeah. one thing that I notice is that it's not been done by the Chinese. It's been done by the US. So. Uh, this, is, has, this is interesting. Do we have the US gaining at the expense of the Chinese in, in building in terms of Africa? Clearly, there is, a, uh, there is a, there's a competition. And it seems that Ethiopia and other African nations have the upper hand and that they can choose which country that they want to work with. So it's a lovely story in the sense that we're, the power is back in African hands, as it were. Hmm. And African hands always tells us the story. Do you believe that? other African countries would uh, take this step and follow these ambitious projects in the hope that it will improve their own economical development and hopefully project Africa on the right trajectory to mm -hmm. become one of the fastest growing continents in the world. I have to think about that one. I, th I believe that it's possible. And seeing that Ethiopia is amongst, you know, one of the 10 fastest growing economies, and it's moving towards becoming a middle income country, you know, vying with India and South American nations. There is that possibility. I would say, obviously, given the gaze that East Africa has always had in terms of it being poverty-stricken, you know, agricultural burden, no necessary in, in industry, it seems to be moving in a different direction. But then again, I would argue that we would have to move in our own direction, in the sense that contextualise. So what does Ethiopia and Djibouti need? Is this fuel pipeline necessary? And I would say it, do it, w it does, because not only does it increase energy and security, as the article states, but it also aids economic development. But crucially, it also reduces harmful emissions that, that comes about such, such economic plans. So um, are you confident that if the US or the Chinese embark yeah. on a, a country, a continent-wide expansion on this sort of scale, uh, that African countries could potentially break that cycle of poverty uh, and inequality? I believe so. I think historically, if we look back past East African and West African slave trade, that there was this time where Africa was actually very much a prosperous and, you know, a centre of many empires. But now we don't have that narrative and hopefully we, we can go back to that. Changing of the narrative is so important. What's your next article? Our next story is from Quartz Africa online um, and it's, 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 it's a funny one because it's looking at cartoonists in reaction to the Tanzanian election that's uh, to come about uh, but, this month. But we've got physical violence, abusive language in this particular election. Is this the worst we've seen Tanzanian politics? I, you, no, I don't think so. I think it's 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 a 
it's a, a continuation of previous elections. I would say given the rise of obviously social media and the ability of us to really hone into such elections from an international standpoint has allowed us to scrutinise such elections to a further degree than previously. I would say it's pretty much the same. What, what I particularly like about this, this article is the fact that it has a different tone whereby we're looking at the, the not the romanticised, but the fun part of elections, that voters can, in effect, have a voice. And in this instance, it's through cartoons that are um, showing not only the political narrative in terms of the negative, in terms of the issues that are not being addressed by politicians, uh, but also looking at the issues that really affects people on the ground, meaning health and education, and articulating that in a, in a, in a, in a funny manner. Well, war of words, no doubt about this. Cartoonists are going to have their field day as we progress in the days and the weeks ahead. Um, do you think that the cartoonists will start focusing mm -hmm. on education, health, uh, as opposed to the backbiting, uh, all this about the politics? I think sometimes you just have to have a laugh. Uh, it, it, there's only so much that the mandate can... can you, ha you, ha you have the voting power, but in effect, you have two opposition parties hopefully two opposition parties, that you cannot necessarily choose. So to have that sort of aspect whereby you can scrutinise them from this level and then have it play out on an international scale at the uh, Vipaji Gallery in Dar es Salaam, I think can only really say, say good things for democracy in Tanzania. And yes, Omar, thank you so much for that. We're taking a short break. But when we come back, we're looking at how ethical fashion is taking root in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa as its first tramway in Ethiopia. Don't go away.